with the rapid increase in computational power and widespread use of personal computers, code writers have sought to expand the approaches available for stability design of steel structures. The effective length method was first introduced in the 1961 AISC specification and it has served the profession for over 45 years. The latest addition to the AISC is the direct analysis method, which eliminates the need for a calculation of the column effective length factor K in the design process, a source of potential error and confusion for practicing engineers designing complex steel structures. It also develops a stability design approach that applies in the same logical and consistent way to all types of structures, including braced frames, moment frames, and combined framing systems. In this video, we will show a step-by-step -step procedure of how to conduct the direct analysis method to assess the stability of a steel frame, with the first step being to develop a model of the building frame that captures all the essential aspects of frame behavior. Remember to account for three-dimensional aspects of the loading for wind and seismic loads as prescribed by the applicable building code. Use reduced member properties, 80% of the flexural member stiffness EI and the axial member stiffness EA for all members which contribute to the stability of the frame, where E is the elastic modulus and A is the cross-sectional area of the member and I is the moment of inertia about the axis of bending. It is suggested that all steel member properties contributing to the elastic stiffness be multiplied by 0.8 with the exception of member flexural rigidities, which should be multiplied by 0.8 tau b. This includes connections, panel zones, diaphragms, column bases, and member shear stiffnesses. Uniform application of this stiffness reduction to all the structural components, including leaning columns, is most consistent with the fundamental basis of the direct analysis method and avoids possible anomalies in the analysis results such as false differential column actual deformations. The tau b factor is applied as follows. When alpha PR over PY is less than or equal to 0.5, tau is equal to 1. But when alpha PR over PY is greater than 0.5, tau is less than 1. PY can be found by multiplying yield strength with the cross-sectional area. Next step would be to determine all gravity loads that are stabilized by the lateral load resisting system. This can be self-weight, rain load, snow load, dead load, and or live load, or any load in the direction of gravity. Remember that in case the loads were not available for the structure you are trying to design, you can always refer to ASCE 7 to determine the minimum design loads associated with the structure you are trying to design. The next step would be to determine the lateral loads corresponding to the wind in both lateral orthogonal directions, as well as the seismic load requirements in both lateral orthogonal directions. Next, we determine the notional lateral loads which are intended to account for the overall effects of out-of-plumb geometry imperfections and apply them either as minimum lateral loads in the gravity-only load combinations or as additive lateral loads for all load combinations based on the following rules. Notional load at level I is equal to 0.2% of the gravity load YI, where YI is the gravity load at level I from each LRFD load combination being considered. The notional loads NI may be applied as a minimum lateral load solely in the gravity only load combinations in cases where the second order effect, as measured by the ratio of the average second order to first order story drifts, are less than or equal to 1.5, or equivalently less than or equal 1.71 for the direct analysis method model 
based on the reduced properties. Otherwise, the notional loads Ni must be applied as an additive lateral load to all load combinations. For wind load combinations on buildings where Ni must be applied additively, the wind pressures on the roof may be considered in calculating Yi. This can reduce the total downward vertical load substantially for some low-rise building structures, but should be used with caution. Next is deciding the direction of the notional loads. The notional loads should be applied in a direction that increases the overall destabilizing effect on the frame for the load combination being considered. For gravity-only load combinations that cause a net side sway due to non-symmetry of the loads or geometry, the notional loads should be applied in the direction that increases the net side sway. For structures with multiple stories or levels and in which the side sway deformations are in different directions in different stories or levels, it is necessary to include a pair of load combinations separately considering the notional loads associated with an out of plumbness in each direction. For load combinations where the notional loads are combined with lateral loads, the notional loads should be applied only in the direction that adds to the effect of the lateral loads. Also, the notional lateral loads Ni should be applied independently about each of the two orthogonal building axes. These axes should be selected as approximate principal lateral stiffness directions for the overall building structure. Note, independently means that the notional loads are applied only in one direction at a time. For general structural analysis, the notional loads may be applied at each location where gravity load is transferred to the structural columns. The load YI is the gravity load transferred to the columns at each of these locations. Next step is to perform a second order analysis for all the applicable load combinations. Any second order analysis method that properly considered both P capital delta and P small delta effects is permitted. The P capital delta refers to the effect due to relative displacement between member ends, whereas P small delta effect refers to the effect of the local geometry change. Note that, unlike first order analysis, superposition of basic load cases is not appropriate when a general second order analysis is employed, because the second order effects are nonlinear. Next step would be to design the various members and connections for the forces obtained from the analysis according to the applicable provisions of the AISC specification. For beams or members having either shear or bending moment only, or both, refer to chapter F for design of members under flexure and G for design of members under shear. For columns or members under compression only, refer to chapter E for design of members under compression. For members under tension only, refer to chapter D. For all the beam column members, refer to chapter H and apply the interaction equations H1-1A and H1-1B using an effective length factor K is equal to 1. If the additive notional lateral loads of 0.2% of the gravity loads are not included in the lateral load combinations as permitted by step 4, Confirm for each level of the frame that the second order side sway effects as measured by the ratio of the average second to first order story drifts are less than or equal to 1.71 based on a model using the reduced member stiffness properties. If this limit is violated, then the notional lateral loads must be applied in addition to the lateral loads in the lateral load combinations. If the notional lateral loadings are applied additively in all the load combinations, this check may be skipped. Next would be to check the seismic drift limits using nominal member properties according to ASCE 7 section 12.12 .12, and maximum P delta effects as prescribed by ASCE 7 section 12.8.7. .7. Next would be to check the wind drifts using nominal member properties for service level wind loads. Note that this check is a surfaceability check, not a code requirement. 
Also note that for moment frames, drift under wind or seismic load levels will typically control the design. Therefore, this check should be made first in the initial proportioning of member sizes for these frame types. In addition, note that the service drift analysis should not include any of the stiffness reduction or notional lateral loads associated with the direct analysis method strength analysis and design procedures. The direct analysis method is great and has many advantages. The direct analysis method is applicable to all frame types, including braced, moment, and combined frames. The direct analysis method permits all columns to be designed using an effective length factor k is equal to 1, thus avoiding many of the complexities and uncertainties in the proper calculation of k. This is a major benefit to the designer. The method focuses the designer's attention on providing sufficient sideway stiffness for the full structural system. As with the effective length method, the method focuses the designer's attention on the destabilizing effects of out of plumbness of frames by requiring the application of notional lateral loads or an explicit nominal out of plumbness. The method focuses attention on the softening of the lateral load resisting frame at the ultimate limit state by requiring a reduction in member properties. It also directly highlights inelastic effects on columns and frames stiffness by the application of tau b in the analysis. The direct analysis method provides more accurate estimates of the internal forces in the structure. The influence of geometric imperfections and stability effects is included in the calculation of the internal forces in the beams, beam columns and their connections, whereas the effective length method does not. This can be particularly important for beams and connections that support relatively light gravity loads but provide rotational restraint to the ends of columns. Also, these more accurate estimates can be particularly important for checking the strength of beam columns, subjected predominantly to uniaxial bending, that are relatively weak in the direction of out-of-plane bending. The method can be applied for inelastic analysis and design as well as for elastic analysis and design. The method can also be applied to composite and mixed framing systems. However, it's not all sunshine and rainbows. The direct analysis method requires the additional step of modifying member properties in the computer model input. Care must be taken to always use the correct nominal properties in serviceability checks or in checking member sizes for code conformance. Application of tau b is an extra iterative step in the design process, although this step can be eliminated by increasing the notional loads by 0.1% of the gravity loads added to each load combination. However, this additional notional lateral load impacts all elements in the lateral load resisting system, not just the highly loaded members. Application of notional lateral loads is an additional step that designers are not accustomed to. However, for many practical building frames, the notional loads need be considered only as a minimum lateral load in the gravity only load combinations. The direct analysis method is more sensitive to the accuracy of the second order analysis than the effective length method. For structures that are governed by elastic sideway buckling, the nonlinear variation of the internal forces and moments as the stability limit is approached results in rapidly increasing member unity check values. These values include required moment over the moment capacity for bending members, the required compressive force over the compressive capacity for compression members, or the interaction equation value for beam columns. As a result, the designer may mistakenly believe that members have ample reserve capacity due to a small calculated value for the unity checks when in reality these checks may reach or exceed one in the critical members with only a small increase in the applied load on the structure. The direct analysis method is based on assumed out of plumbness values that are estimated and largely uncertain in today's modern fabrication and direction. However, Many frames are not sensitive to the out-of-plumbness values used. Also, the nominal out-of-plumbness of 0.2% of 
which is based on the column erection tolerances in the AISC Code of Standard Practice, produces results that are consistent with the accounting for geometric imperfections that is now included implicitly in design by the effective length method. Don't forget to like and subscribe and turn on the notification bell. Thank you for watching.